Hello, I'm sitting here with my bathrobe on in honor of the coronavirus shutdown shut in. Gabby's <laughs> drinking a Corona beer and, and having some soup while we're talking. Okay, so I promised last time, I don't know if I promised, but I said I probably would, do something on my own shadow. Uh, I already did a thing called light and shadow that was very small, and I'm sure shadow will figure hugely in this whole series because really that is what we're missing in our culture is an acknowledgement of the shadow within each of us and within everything that's going on, and so then we keep projecting it onto other people and groups and situations and political parties and who knows what else. But anyway, so here we are uh, in the middle of uh, fear, F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. Let's keep on remembering that that's really what it is. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to go into more fear-mongering here. What I'm going to do is say, isn't this amazing that for the very first time in history, we have everybody in the world united with a certain feeling? I mean, that's never happened. They tried to do it with climate change. It didn't work. This worked instantly. Why? Because it's more personal. Everybody's worried about their body. Will they make it? Meaning they're really worried about dying. Dying now, not in 10 years or 12 years like Greta says, but now. They're worried. They're scared. Why? Because they're not in touch with their bodies, is my sense. Most people are not in touch with their bodies. That's another whole video. And I've written about it on exopermaculture. But meanwhile, I went back and found some of this old writing that I, I um, identified as showing myself, to myself, uh, the shadow material in myself coming out through the writing. And I think it's really interesting. I've always been the kind of person who, when I go to a bookstore and I look and I want to make sure that I maybe, maybe don't want the book or do want the book, I look at just one paragraph because I can get the feeling of the author and the author's authenticity in that one paragraph. If the author is, is purely left brain, only giving information, it doesn't interest me. But for me, what has to happen is there has to be a personal connection to the, from the author to his work, whatever it is. And you can feel that in the language used, but especially in the rhythm and the tone. And so that's what I want to sh focus on here to show the shadow in me, uh, how it was operating in certain times of my life, which I rediscovered doing this whole recapitulation project for my life, which has to do with looking at all the writings that I've done all this time since I was about 26. Um, so I'm 77, so that's over 50 years. And uh, it's humongous. I finally made a... Um, Excel sheet out of the titles and there's more more than 300 now Okay, so uh, I already mentioned my journals showing uh, Huge attempts to control especially in personal relationships Tremendous attempts to control and I would say going along with that are Judgments and I would say I still that is a still a big issue for me is just this instant judgment And what does that mean if you're thinking in terms of say? Um, Martin Buber he talks about the I thou and the I it two different kinds of relationships that we can have So if we're working with an I it That's when we can judge because we see the person not as a person but as an object in the room and we're going to move them around, or we're going to squash them, or we're going to fix them, change them, whatever. If we see the other person as a thou, then we bow to them because they are a beautiful soul, just like we are. And there's a huge difference between the two. And so I am having to constantly remind myself to move from I, it to I, thou, because I, it is so easy. And what we're doing in that case, we're projecting something within ourselves onto the other person and saying, either we do like them or we don't like them for that reason. But really it's ourselves we're talking about. Okay, so now looking at my more formal writing, uh, not my journals in other words, I wanna do two things. I wanna look at a time 
when I was, um, I had just been fired from New College back in 1973, and this was in the spring of 74, and I, did, I, I recognized when it was when I started reading through this, this sucker, this manuscript. I thought, when was this written? Oh yeah, 74. I was utterly furious. And it shows. It shows in a number of ways. So let's just, um, but it, what it comes across as is pretension, okay? Pretending to mean something, but really not, okay? It, actually, it starts out with, it's called, the first, it's called hearts. It starts out with a, two words, cancer word. The world you, loses its meaning to the extent that I mean it. I mean what I say. To prop up my existence, I take a fix on you. I open and close the split second as the measure of it all. See what I mean by pretentious? The world loses its meaning to the extent that each hole in it finds its spot as the center of that circle I am on the brink of jumping into. Whatever I know, I am. Whatever I am, I am not the master of. And what I am not the master of is the master of me. Now there is some truth in that. <laughs> Free will, then, as the bare bones of antiquity, seen through the veil, seen through this veil, V-A-L-E, of tears, of memory, of the loss of my face. Okay, that's pretentious. The whole thing altogether is pretentious, though there are aspects of it, like we're talking about circles and cycles and centers and holes and all of that, I'm totally into. That is my main metaphor, as a matter of fact. And I thought it came from astrology, but actually it doesn't. Astrology helped me formalize it. Okay, here's, here's another one <laughs> from the same manuscript. Home is where the heart is. Home is where the heart is. It lies there beating bloody on the middle of the living room floor. It lies there staining the carpet, straining each beat a bloody history. Slowly it shifts. Slowly it shifts to accommodate. My heart is a pump. The world is a well. This sun is my hell. It shows and tells. It reports on each beat of my heart. Okay, again, pretension. On the other hand, what's interesting to me about this piece is I was experimenting in the whole thing with rhythm and tone, right? And so the meaning is almost secondary. The rhythm and tone, though, are very interesting to me uh, because they show a propulsive force, which I was feeling at the time. And actually, what we're talking about underneath, remember, the pretension was fury, absolute fury. And that has to do with ego, because I'd been fired, and I hadn't processed it yet at all. It took me about five years to process that. That was a big one. Okay, now let's go forward to, um, this is the 1984, so that was in the 70s, this is 10 years later now. And now, by this time, I am a, I am a peace activist doing a magazine with another woman. Uh, is this all up? Yeah, that gives you backwards, does it? Does it get backwards? No? Okay. With another woman. And this, this, this magazine, we did it for about three years, and it was just a collection of stuff that we got in from various activists all over what we call the Deep West, okay, which is not the Northwest, not the Southwest, not the Mountain West, uh, the Deep West, which is Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, basically. And I was traveling all over those states um, networking uh, to peace activists because what was going on then was the MX missile. I don't think they ever got that missile in. I'm not sure. I can't remember. I gotta go back and check. But the MX missile was a big deal back then in terms of you know, ramping up the nu nuclear situation. It was done under Reagan's presidency, uh, who interestingly enough, he was similar to Trump, I think, for me anyway, because when he was, when he was uh, elected, I was like horrified. And uh, he horrified me when he did the Star Wars thing. But then he got together with Gorbachev and he wanted peace. And he thought the only way to get it was through strength. So you first you beef, beef up your military, then you go for peace. That may be the case, it, the case. This may be what Trump's doing now too. 
he says he is doing that. And I tend to believe him. Okay, now, so back to Heartland. Now we're, we're talking about a different stage of my shadow. And, um, however, here's a piece that comes from this. Uh, and when was this? How far along had we gone in that time? That was number 10. Okay, so we're, we're, we're quite a ways into it. We were publishing it every six weeks, and it was a difficult process, as you can imagine. So here's what I call it, and this reminds me of a couple of other videos I've done. Those of us working for peace in our local regions usually feel called upon to absorb as much information about nukes as we possibly can. Think about coronavirus. Think about um, uh, climate change. Think about any of these things that are brought in to, that we're supposed to be totally afraid of. Okay, so we're supposed to absorb. We have to understand it. If we can understand it, maybe we can figure it out and control it. That's where I was at. This learning process both helps us galvanize our feelings about the state our poor earth is in and also makes us better able to inform others. Sometimes, however, the information we learn is so horrible, so shocking, so endlessly dark that it threatens to overwhelm us, paralyzing both our will and our action. I suggest at these times we remember, however dark the subject of nuclear war and nation's preparations for it, that darkness is but a shadow. Imagine then how intense, how extraordinarily bright this light must be which casts that shadow. <laughs> Yin Yang, matter energy, day night, light dark. Mystics down through the ages remind us of the essentially dynamic bipolar nature of reality. This reminder can help us too. Let us embrace the paradox. Let us have courage to face the darkness while living and drawing energy from the bright light from which that darkness springs. Such an enlarged understanding has real world implications. Our newfound ability to destroy both our species and our planet is precisely the catalyst we need to begin to see ourselves and our earth as one undivided whole. And I would suggest that what's happening now with the coronavirus is we are beginning to feel ourselves as one undivided whole through fear. Not that that's a, the emotion we want to you know, encourage, but it is, it is what everybody can recognize in themselves. And so that's where we're going. Anyway, that was not, uh, that was not an example of the kind of thing I want to uh, get across. I, here's another one. Read. But the point is, a lot of my editorials for Heartland were very strident. Um, they were strident and they, they, they acted as if, unless we solve this problem this minute, it's all over. We're all going to die. And I remember a couple of years into doing Heartland, I'm going, why haven't we all died yet? I mean, I, I, it was like, I, I, and I'm still kind of astonished that we haven't especially given our capacity for nuclear war. And really, it's underneath everything, and it's worse than anything. It's still going on, but we're still here. I mean, I go, what? We're still here? I mean, that part of me that is an apocalyptic thinker is always astonished. So what I've been working on for the last, I don't know when, since... Since, you know, maybe 20 years ago, some 30 years ago, I don't know. I've been working on letting go of apocalyptic thinking. Letting go of this feeling that I've got to figure everything out right now. Letting go of feeling scared all the time. Letting go of worrying about anything. Just being with what is. And what is just keeps on changing. I don't know if you've noticed that. Anybody who's lived as long as I have keeps on noticing that. And the other thing we notice, it keeps on changing, and yet it keeps on staying the same, too, because we always have some issue that we're working on. And people like me, who is a double Sagittarian, you know, we have the biggest issues. We're all, always interested in the most, Im, the most important, the biggest perspective we can possibly get on whatever's going on. 
and uh, you know, and I've got to have it, or 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 I feel not just unsatisfied, but I feel terrified. So there's where fear still still comes back in, still comes back in, and I've got to learn how to just let it come, just let it come, and and just keep going. Um, my husband, my husband Jeff, used to say to me. He used to say, when I'd get worked up about something, he'd say, uh, Anne, is there anything you can do about it? And then I'd just stop, you know, no, I guess not. <laughs> then why worry about it? And I said the same thing to him, actually, but I want to say that to the very end. So what's happened lately in the last 10 years is the point is to focus on something else besides oblivion, to focus on something else besides we're all going down with the coronavirus or with the nukes or whatever. To focus on something that's good, to focus on what you want to bring into the world, to focus on the beauty that's there already and encouraging that both within ourselves and within everyone else. And the practice that I found that is, besides personal practices of you know, my qigong, tai chi, and walking, and yoga, uh, the practice I found that is most hopeful, and hope is required, we want to think that maybe we can do something, is permaculture. That's why I'm a permaculturist. And that's why just about everybody I connect with these days is a permaculturist, because it connects us back to the natural world. It puts us in touch with the natural world in a way that slows us down and makes us realize that we are, you know, we are just part of this earth. We are not the rulers. We are connected. We are participants in what's going on rather than the dominators. Okay, so here's the story. Jeff and I, Jeff was not he wasn't used to um, being in the mountains, and I we used to live in Jackson Hole, and um, we would drive. I would usually drive over Teton Pass, which is a very steep pass. I think it's like 10% grade part of it. I mean, it's incredibly steep, and you 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 do get a little unnerved by it. What if your brakes went out? Would you be able to de deal with the downhill? And um, but he was really scared, and finally he. He, he, he did get in the car to be the driver, and he, but he's just so scared, you know, and there's this drop-off all the way. There's this drop-off on one side or drop-off on the other. And finally I said to him, Jeff, pay attention to the road. Pay attention to where you're going rather than the abyss that lies off to the side. And I would say the same thing to us now. Pay attention to where we want to go, especially, rather than the abyss of, you know, millions of dead or whatever it is that they're promoting now. Pay attention. What is it that we want to bring in? Let's do it. And this coronavirus time of wearing, I forgot to mention, I, did I say I had my bathrobe on? <laughs> I had my bathrobe on. This time is a time when we can all reset our hard drives internally. Where do you want to go? What are you doing that you're supposed to not be doing? What, are, what do you want to be doing? What if your life was just another couple weeks long? What would you be doing with it? How would you be acting with other people? I'm saying the same thing to myself. Thanks.